We'll attend to a prayer by House Chaplain Reverend Bob Stewart, pastor of St. Paul's United Methodist Church in Manchester. Good morning, Mr. Speaker, and good morning, New Hampshire House of Representatives. Happy New Year to all of you. Let us all be in a spirit of prayer. Oh God, we come with gratitude for this new year, this new day, and then this new house session for 2023. You have called us, oh God, to do the work of this great state of New Hampshire. You have called us to be careful and efficient stewards. To this end, we bind together as one body for the state of New Hampshire. We seek your guidance for this House of Representatives, and we seek your help to govern them throughout their work. Be with each member as they navigate through all the pressing matters that come before them today and in the days that lie ahead. Give wisdom and vision, O oh God, to those who serve as representatives for the people of their communities. And God, Guide all the leaders that are gathered here today and that in turn through their leadership, they may lead and guide this body to the best of their ability. We ask that you keep your hand upon each leader and upon each representative to accomplish the task set before them. May all gathered here today work together in harmony for the good of this state and for the good and welfare of the people. O oh God, in all our discussions today, give us the clarity and help us in the understanding of differing views. In our voting, give us wisdom and integrity, and let it be the voice of the people. O oh, loving and gracious God, be with us and help this to be a fruitful 2023, both personally and professionally. We ask all this in the name of you who has created everything into being. Amen. Chair recognizes a member of Peterborough, Representative John and Wheeler, who will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. The chair recognizes Lucius Nearing of Dover, who will sing our national anthem. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled Banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the
The House will attend a request for... I could have made you stand for the whole session, but... <laughs> The, the House will attend to request for leaves of absence. Mr. Speaker, the day, illness, Representatives Bartlett, Conlin, Granger, Hamlet, Seth King, Parshall. The day, important business, Representatives Barry, DeSilvestro, Catherine Kenny, Kahn, Spillsbury, and Trottier. The day, illness in the family, Representative Anita Burroughs. These leaves of absence shall be granted unless otherwise ordered by the House. The House will attend the introduction of guests. Mr. Speaker, please welcome Anthony Henry, student at Pinkerton Academy in Derry, our page for the day. Welcome to the New Hampshire House. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, please welcome Stacy Brooks, Donna and Morgan Mackay, guests of Representatives Groda, Malloy, Balboni, and Maggior. Jean Taylor, spouse of Representative Schultz, Aaron Bolia, son of Representative Harvey Bolia. They are with us in the gallery today. Welcome to the New Hampshire House. The House will attend to a communication. Mr. Speaker. In a letter dated December 21st, 2022, Paul Smith, Clerk of the House. Dear Paul, please be advised that the following representatives elect were sworn into office by the Governor Executive Council on this day. Hillsborough District 18, Juliet Smith, Stratford County District 12, Kenneth Vincent. Sincerely, David M. Scanlon, Secretary of State. Welcome to the New Hampshire House. The House will attend to further communication. Mr. Speaker, in an email on December 22nd, Dear Clerk and members of the House, I would like to inform you that I am choosing to resign from my reelected position as a state representative from Nashua Ward 4. I, Representative elect Stacy Marie Lawton of Nashua, New Hampshire, Ward 4, Hillsborough County, District 3, have chosen to resign from my reelected position as a state representative. It is with a heavy heart that I have to tender my resignation. It has been an honor of a lifetime to serve in the New Hampshire House over the last two years, and I ran again knowing I could serve again over the next two years. However, certain life events have come up that will make it difficult for me to serve my next term. I believe ethically I must step aside and allow a special election to take place to fill my vacant seat. I will continue to remain engaged in my community and serve my neighbors. Many blessings, Reverend Stacy Marie Lawton. The res resignation is accepted. The House will attend to a resolution. Mr. Speaker, Representatives Osborne and Wilhelm offer the following. Resolve that the House of Representatives inform the Honorable Senate it is ready to meet in joint convention for the purpose of canvassing the votes for Governor and Executive Council. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed nay. The ayes have it. And the resolution is adopted. Chair, recognize the clerk. Mr. Speaker, the Senate is now ready to meet with the House of Representatives and join convention for the purpose of canvassing the votes for governor and executive council. The House will come to order. Chair recognizes Sergeant at Arms.
while we're waiting for our uh, Senate colleagues, would members turn on your voting stations? Make sure you turn them on. Mr. Speaker. Chair recognizes the Sergeant at Arms. Mr. Speaker, the Honorable Senate. Chair recognizes Sergeant at Arms. Mr. Speaker, President of the Senate, the Honorable Jeb Bradley of Wolfboro. The Joint Convention will come to order. The Joint Convention has been formed for the purpose of canvassing votes for the Governor and Executive Council. The Joint Convention will attend to a resolution. Mr. Speaker, Representative Osborne and Senator Carson offer the following resolved that the Honorable Secretary of State be requested to lay before the Joint Convention the return votes for Governor and Executive Council. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed nay. The ayes have it. The resolution is adopted. The chair recognizes the sergeant at arms. Mr. Speaker, New Hampshire Secretary of State, David M. Scanlon. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, Mr. President, and honorable members of the general court, as required by Articles 42 and 60 of Part 2 of the New Hampshire Constitution, the Secretary of State is required to appear before you on this day to present the return of votes for governor and executive council uh, from the general election that was held on November 8, 2022. For the Office of Governor, in Belknap County, Christopher Sununu received 20,449 votes. Tom Sherman received 9,429. In Carroll County, Sununu received 16,554 votes. Sherman received 10,306. In Cheshire County, Sununu received 16,503 votes. Sherman received 16,890. In Coas County, Sununu received 8,251 votes. Sherman received 4,194. Grafton County, Sununu received 20,427 votes. 
Sherman received 21,483. Hillsborough County, Sununa received 99,608 votes. Sherman received 69,673. Merrimack County, Sununa received 38,669 votes. Sherman received 30,835. Rockingham County, Sununa received 92,043 votes. Sherman received 59,759. In Stratford County, Sununa received 29,100 votes. Sherman received 26,495. Sullivan County, Sununa received 11,159 votes. Sherman received 7,702. In total, Chris Sununa received 352,813 votes. Tom Sherman received 256,776 votes. There were also two Libertarian candidates that ran for governor. Carlin Borisenko received 2,772 votes statewide, and Kelly Halderson received 5,071 votes statewide. Chris Sununu, having a plurality of 96,047 votes, was elected governor. For executive council in the first district, Joseph Kenny received 63,230 votes. Dana Hilliard received 59,060 votes. Having a plurality of 4,170 votes, Joe Kenny was elected executive counselor. In the second district, Cindy Warmington received 74,107 votes. Harold French received 49,428 votes. Uh, having a plurality of 24,679 votes, Cindy Warmington was elected executive counselor. In the third district, Janet Stevens received 69,898 votes. Catherine Haraki had 61,506 votes. Uh, having a plurality of 8,392 votes, Janet Stevens was elected executive counselor. In the fourth district, Ted Gassis received 58,123 votes. Kevin Kavanaugh received 52,858 votes. Having a plurality of 5,265 votes, Ted Gatsis was elected executive counselor. In the 5th District, Dave Wheeler received 61,044 votes. Shoshona Kelly received 55,692 votes. Having a plurality of 5,352 votes, Dave Wheeler was elected executive counselor. That concludes uh, my report uh, before you. Uh, I wish all of you a productive session, uh, and I hope this was the driest speech that you'll hear for the next two years. <laughs> Thank you. The joint convention will attend to a resolution. Mr. Speaker, Representative Osborne and Senator Carson offer the following. Resolve that the vote for governor and the executive council be referred to a committee consisting of three on the part of the House and two on the part of the Senate to compare and count the same and report thereon. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed nay. The ayes have it. And the resolution is adopted. Chair appoints Representative Stephen Smith, Representative Sanborn, Senator Wilhelm, Senators Carson, and Senator Susie. Representative Osborne and Senator Carson move that the joint convention arise. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed nay. The ayes have it and the joint convention is adjourned.
The House will come to order. The House will attend to memorial remarks. The Chair recognizes Representative Nodder for memorial remarks for the Honorable Philip Strait. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and good morning, colleagues. Last term, we had several memorial remarks for representatives from the town of Merrimack, including those for the late Tony Pellegrino. This year, we lost the Honorable Phil Strait. There's just no talking about Phil without also mentioning Tony. The two went together like the two old men in the balcony on The Muppet Show. That's always what I thought of when I rode with them to Concord. Phil lived about a mile south of my house, while Tony lived a mile north. We tried rotating drivers for a while, but it made the most sense to just have Phil drive. I sat in the back seat, and my view was the back of the heads of Statler and Waldorf. Sometimes our late speaker, Dick Hinch, would ride up with us. It was comedy the whole ride up. There's just something about the way men talk to each other that I find amusing. Phil Strait served two terms. He was the vice chair of Veterans Affairs. For the town, he served on many levels, including the Watson Park Gazebo Subcommittee. He had a degree in agriculture. I saw him in the park one day with a book four inches thick on the subject. Just some light reading while he waited for the rest of us to, to meet him there to campaign. We took out our ads together, Waldorf, Statler, and I. Selfies were a new thing at the time, and we still had an actual town paper. That's where I sent our re-elect selfie pics. Phil spoke with an accent that I thought was Southern, but was, in reality, Midwestern. Every time he said, Hinch, I would laugh. Speaker Hinch didn't understand why it was funny. It just was. Now, Phil wasn't without opinions. We probably all have a constituent or two that we could swear have no life at all outside their keyboard and social media. Non-stop lecturing rants. Needless to say, we'd have differing opinions on just about everything with such a constituent. Phil, Phil summed one of them up one time and said, she is like a rabid animal that sinks her teeth in and doesn't let go. Even so, he would show nothing but kindness to individuals like that, which always impressed me. He was a good guy. I think one of my favorite things about Phil was that he was a huge fan of Ronald Reagan. My youngest son used to host a birthday party every year on February 6th. Our friend, Representative Mooney, was in attendance every time. She can attest that it was a big deal. Cake, jelly beans, a stand-up Reagan DVD playing in the background, and Reagan gifts that varied year to year. Phil contributed to the memorial display with Reagan items from his private collection. Sometimes I would find Reagan items on our front doorstep. Like Santa Claus, he would arrive while we were sleeping and leave gifts for my son. He was so generous. I wish you all could have known him. His first term was my second term. My state house bestie at the time was the former representative Lynette Peterson. I love her to death, but if you knew her, you would understand this next line. Poor Phil had to sit next to her his first term up there towards the back of section two. From section four, I could see him trying to conceal a belly laugh. Lynette has that effect on some people. For others, not so much. We affectionately called Representative Strait Uncle Phil. When Lynette and I checked our mail in the ante room, Lynette thought it would be funny to stuff all our unwanted mail in Phil's mail slot. She would wave me over and say, come on, Janine, let's go see if Uncle Phil got me mail. It never stopped being funny to us. And we're not supposed to do that, by the way, so don't. When Phil passed away this fall, I met his daughter at the services. I told Brenda that her dad talked about her all the time. She knew who I was too, and it was like two sisters who were raised apart meeting for the first time. She wanted to hear all the stories and see all the pictures. I practically wrote her a whole book like I did for Tony Pellegrino's daughter. There's just too much to say for a Reps Hall Memorial. I will tell you this. She loved hearing all the stories, and she cherished every picture I sent. 
So if you have any pictures of Tony or Phil, please send them to me and I'll send them on to his family, on to his daughters, both of whom I consider family. Because as you all know, or you will know, this body, in a sense, is a family. And the bond is lifelong. I miss you, Uncle Phil. And you too, Tony. And all the others from this legislative family who have been called home. May their memories be eternal. Thank you. The House will please arise for a moment of silence. The chair recognizes Senator Rhodes for memorial march for Henry Parkhurst. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Happy New Year to you and to you all. Colleagues, I rise today to offer memorial remarks in the remembrance of the Honorable Henry A. L. Parkhurst of Winchester. While I was galling this vast list of accomplishments that Representative Parkhurst has acquired, I started thinking that this man just may be the very reason that the term, the man, the myth, the legend, has came about. Or very possibly the song by Frank Sinatra, I did it my way. Honorable Henry Parkhurst served 18 years, which we all know to be nine terms in the New Hampshire House of Representatives serving Winchester on the Resources, Recreation, and Developmental Committee. He served in the U.S. Coast Guard. He was the moderator of the town of Winchester School District for 23 years. At the time of his passing, he was the committee chairman for the Winchester Cemetery Board of Trustees, which he served on for 41 years. Henry served on the town's Community Center Board of Incorporators for over 25 years and oversaw the Boston Cane for 25 years. Additionally, Henry was a swim instructor. And let me not forget his actual career. Henry retired from teaching school, and this is still being a little bit debated after 25 plus years. Now, if this isn't enough to make you all reflect on the fact that we may not be doing nearly enough, what Henry was most proud of was his crowning title of Mr. Pickle. Winchester has an annual Pickle Fest that has been running for 25 years strong. After the first year, Henry was crowned Mr. Pickle and has been the only person to hold said title. Giving the way the New Hampshire House honors and celebrates St. Patrick's Day, well, this gave him another reason to dust off and wear the top hat and green jacket. While I was talking with our house clerk about Representative Parkhurst, he was laughing while he was telling about numerous encounters he and others had had with Henry over his 18 years in the House of Representatives. And honestly, he couldn't stop laughing. Then many, many of you, many people in town that I spoke with immediately mentioned the toes. Everybody knows that Henry wore open-toed sandals everywhere, no matter the weather. I'm quite proud of my shoes. And to walk into a room, I mean, exhibit A, and to have his toes be more spoke about than my shoes. I'm like, dude, <laughs> but, it, but it happened. I had to, I had to yield, <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> Henry wanted to make everybody laugh and he wanted a reaction out of you. And I didn't have a whole lot of interactions with Henry, but what I did have was rememberable. And I'm just gonna share one classic story with you that is going to go down in history. This is gonna sound like I'm telling you all a joke, but I'm not, this is a true story. To say our school deliberative was going off the rails would be an understatement. Being very discouraged with the chaos, my friend Mary approached the microphone. She stood tall and she said, Mr. Moderator, what are the rules we are following here? Are they Robert's rules? Are they parliamentary procedure? What, Mr. Moderator, what are these rules? Mr. Moderator firmly looked at her right in the corneas and he said, 
We're following my rules, the rules of Henry. Mary looked at him, not satisfied with this answer, and asked, would you care to share what those rules are with the rest of us, Mr. Moderator? Well, Henry stood even taller, kind of smirked a little in this very nonchalant manner, said, clearly they're evolving as we go. <laughs> Representatives, whether you knew Henry is Representative Parkhurst, Mr. Moderator, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Parkhurst, or Mr. Pickle, you knew who Henry was and you will remember him. To the man, the myth, the legend, you did it your way and you will be terribly missed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The House will rise for a moment of silence. Chair recognizes Representative Wilhelm. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move that both sets of memorial remarks be placed in the permanent journal. Without objection. The House will attend to the introduction of bills. Mr. Speaker, Representative Osborne offers the following resolve that in accordance with the list in the possession of the clerk, House bills numbered 10, 15, 20, 30 through 52, 54 through 219, House concurrent resolutions numbered 1 through 4, House resolutions 7 through 12, and constitutional amendment concurrent resolutions 1 through 7 shall be by this resolution read a first and second time by the therein listed titles and referred to the therein designated committees. Are you ready for the question? All those who ever say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The resolution is adopted. Representative Osborne and Wilhelm move the adoption of an amendment to House Rule 66 as proposed by the Rules Committee and as printed in the House calendar. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The amendment is adopted. Representative Osborne and Wilhelm move the adoption of an amendment to House Rule 20 as proposed by the Rules Committee and as printed in the House calendar. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The amendment is adopted. Representative Osborne and Wilhelm move the adoption of amendment to House Rule 43 as proposed by the Rules Committee and as printed in the House calendar. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The amendment is adopted. Representative Osborne and Wilhelm move the adoption of an amendment to House Rule 44A as proposed by the Rules Committee and as printed in the House calendar. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The amendment is adopted. Representatives Osborne and Wilhelm move the adoption of an amendment to House Rule 52 as proposed by the Rules Committee and as printed in the House calendar. I recognize Representative Stephen Pearson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I make a motion, a friendly motion to table this. The, question, the motion is to table. Are you ready for the question? All, all those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The tabling motion passes. Representative Osborne and Wilhelm move the adoption of an amendment to House Rule 64 as proposed by the Rules Committee and printed in the House calendar. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it and the amendment is adopted. We're moving on to floor amendments.
Representative Wilhelm moves an amendment 22 to Rule 22C. Chair recognizes Representative Wilhelm to speak to his motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today in support of an amendment to House Rule 22, which aims to provide proxy voting privileges to House members unable to attend session due to medical condition, illness, or illness in the family. Mr. Speaker, on Organization Day last month, we know that there were members of this body who did not attend House session because they were hospitalized or they had tested positive for COVID-19. For those who have returned to health and have been sworn in, we give thanks and welcome them back today. Mr. Speaker, today on convening day, we know that there are members of this body who are not in attendance because they are hospitalized or they've tested positive for COVID-19. We offer our thoughts and prayers to those who are not with us today with sincere hope for swift and healthy recoveries. Mr. Speaker, we know that on future session days, there will be members of our body who will not be in attendance due to hospitalization or medical condition or because they will test positive for COVID-19 or the flu or because they need to care for a family member who might be ill. With such a closely divided chamber, we all know that attendance will matter more than ever this term. Just as important as our votes is our ability to keep one another healthy and safe as citizen legislators, as volunteers, and as granite staters. This rule amendment simply allows for a member who is unable to attend session due to medical condition, illness, or illness in the family to notify the clerk and designate another member as their proxy before close of business, before session. Since we know that every vote matters, including votes on floor amendments and procedural votes, that proxy would be empowered to cast a vote on every division and roll call vote. Following the vote, the clerk would call on the member carrying the absent member's proxy for them to publicly and audibly cast their vote in front of the entire chamber. No member attending session shall hold more than one proxy for an absent member, and a physical quorum must be present in the House chamber for the proceedings to remain valid. Now, those who oppose proxy voting may cast doubt on the integrity of this process, suggesting that members may appoint a proxy and proceed to go on a tropical vacation. In response, I want to remind members that they, as well as members of the public, have the right to file an ethics complaint over such behavior, which would be the appropriate place to refer such an incident. Those who oppose proxy voting may also suggest that this proposal goes too far by allowing members to vote on procedural votes and floor amendments. In response, I want to again remind the body that in such a closely divided chamber, every vote counts, including on floor amendments and procedural votes, which may be unknown prior to session day. Given the full power and authority a proxy has to represent the absent member, this does, does require a great deal of trust. And should that trust be broken, an ex complaint could be filed and or a new proxy vote could be declared, a new proxy could be declared heading into the next session should there be a long-term illness or medical condition that keeps a member away from Representatives Hall long-term. For those of us caring for children, parents, or other loved ones, staying healthy and keeping our loved ones healthy and safe is very important work. As we begin our work together in this new biennium, there is the additional consequence. Should any of us get sick or our family members get sick or we're absent from a close vote at a House session, it's an added blow, even though it doesn't have to be that way. Colleagues, please join me in looking out for one another's health and well-being as we embark on this new session together. Let's look out for our constituents and ensure that every Granite Stater is fully represented within the walls of this hallowed chamber, even when one of us is unable to attend in person due to medical condition, illness, or illness in the family. Having a contingency plan to see through the commitments we've made to our constituents and to each other is a responsible approach to governance in 2023. By voting to pass this floor amendment to House Rule 22, the New Hampshire House will empower itself 
to follow this example of other legislative chambers across the country, and even the United States Congress, each utilizing proxy voting in their own way to help fulfill their duties. I respectfully urge my colleagues to vote yes on this floor amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Chair recognizes Representative Stephen Smith to speak against the motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, the, the idea of one person, one vote, something that we hold sacred in this country and it's enshrined in federal law. Why should we be any different? I mean, look around at your colleagues. Which one of them do you think should have twice the voting power you do? Because this rule doesn't require that you cast the votes in the manner that the member intended. There's actually not even any recourse in here if they don't, other than that the aggrieved party there can go shopping for somebody else to cast their votes with no hope or guarantee that they will do the same thing. Functionally, this gives a member of the House two votes. I should be able to just stop talking there and sit down, but I know better today. There's no procedure here either. So the, they notify the clerk that this person's gonna be my proxy. Let me tell you about my morning. So I have a bad knee, I gotta have it replaced, haven't had time or money to do it yet. That's a medical problem. And this morning, I have branches in my remote road that I have to get here. I'm trying to clear them. I twist it up pretty bad. Super intense pain. Can't take painkillers because I got an almost two hour drive. It would have been very easy for me to say, you know what? My friend from Auburn, he's just going to cast votes for me from now on anytime there's bad weather because of the risk of damaging my leg further. That's not what I signed up to do. I ran for office so that I could come here and be the physical representation of my district. It's the very least I owe them. And yeah, it doesn't happen all the time. Challenges happen. Children get sick. You hurt yourself. You get sick. But you do the best you can. It's the very least that we owe them to come here and not give our vote away to someone else. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The House will be in order. The question before us is the roll call, a roll call has been called for. Is that sufficiently seconded? It is sufficiently seconded. This will be a roll call vote. Members will take your seats. Members will be in your seats. This will be a roll call vote. Chair recognizes Senator Wilhelm for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know that other states' legislative bodies and even the U.S. Congress have recently authorized proxy voting as a way to protect the health and safety of their members while ensuring duly re elected representatives are provided the opportunity to vote. And if I know that on any given session day, there will be members of both parties on both sides of the aisle who may be home or hospitalized due to medical condition, illness, or illness in the family, and others who will feel significant pressure to show up in Concord to cast a key vote, despite putting their own health and or the health of their colleagues at risk. And Mr. Speaker, if I know that as the minority leader of the sustained body, the caucus I lead, statistically speaking, has less to gain by allowing for proxy voting, but that it's still worth doing because it's the right thing to do, then would I now push the green button to enfranchise every Granite Stater with full representation in this closely divided chamber where every vote on every bill will surely count this session. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Chair recognizes Representative Stephen Smith for parliamentary inquiry. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that a little less than two years ago, when we were trying to figure out how to meet safely, I proposed having people in different rooms and have room captains bring their votes to the chamber. And if I remember that that was that received bipartisan condemnation as being akin to proxy voting, a precedent we should never set here. If I know that no other state right now is using proxy voting and that the United States Congress is getting rid of it. And finally, Mr. Speaker, if those members from the other party who told me I was wrong a little less than two years ago were right then, and that they'll be right today when they vote no, would I press the red button? The motion before us is the Representative Wilhelm's amendment to Rule 22C. This is a roll call vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. Have all members present had an opportunity to vote? House will attend the state of the vote. House will be in order. 171 voting yay, 204 voting nay. The motion fails. Representative Ebel moves to a floor amendment to House Rule 31. The chair recognizes Representative Ebel to speak, Ebel to speak for a floor amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and Happy New Year, colleagues. Long ago and far away, before the pandemic, the vast majority of us had no idea what Zoom was or Microsoft Teams. Many hadn't even attended a meeting online. In March 2020, we sat here overnight plowing through bills at what would be the last House session in this chamber for a really long time. It's been quite a journey and how things have changed. At the Speaker's discretion, this proposed amendment to House Rule 31 would permit our House committees and subcommittees to, to meet remotely or in hybrid, in addition to meeting in person as they do now. A quorum may be determined based on virtual attendance, which was deemed permissible by our state Supreme Court. This rule is required by Mason's rules to permit us to go remote in our committees. You can ask the clerk. This simple common sense proposal enables the speaker to take whatever actions he feels appropriate with respect to remote attendance for members, whether in an emergency or otherwise. As we learned two years ago, one never knows what the next day will bring. This body should be prepared to respond by passing this rule change today. Why wait? It's a great rule to have in our rule box. When the governor declared the state of emergency for our state, Speaker Shirtliff and his team, including me, 
had to act quickly to continue the much needed legislative work we had to do. Long hours were spent with staff members understanding various meeting programs, like learning what Zoom was, developing new protocols for the meetings, setting up member trainings, learning how to mute and unmute, raise those darn little yellow hands, and get our videos on, providing for testimony to be taken, getting the technology to live stream our meetings, and figuring out how to archive them. Speaker Packard continued this work by arranging for hybrid meetings with some committee members in committee rooms and others online. This was to keep us healthy, but as we have learned, all this work had other benefits for us as members and for the public. Today we have the technology for remote participation, the necessary media staff, and committee rooms wired for live streaming. We've successfully held hundreds of remote and hybrid committee meetings. So now, here we are in 2023 with that experience and understanding. We should act accordingly. While not always ideal, we learned that providing the remote option for our members makes our meetings more inclusive. It facilitates attendance for those with health, childcare, or family challenges. Having the remote option can help us represent our constituents better. Parents with sick children can still do their jobs as legislators. Substitute committee members are terrific, but they do not have the knowledge base regular committee members do. As we try to make the legislature more inclusive, particularly for those who are younger, have children, or have to work, it behooves us to permit remote attendance. To be clear, if this rule is adopted, the speaker need not re permit remote testimony. That is the speaker's decision. We now have the know-how and the support system to permit remote participation. We should make our committee meetings more open and facilitate remote attendance. We should pass this common sense enabling amendment to House Rule 31 permitting the speaker to act on remote participation, whether it be for emergencies or day-to-day -day business. We do know how to do this, and we should. Press the green button to pass this amendment. In the interest of time, I'll take no questions. And Mr. Speaker, I request a division vote. Thank you. Chair recognizes Representative Stephen Smith to speak, again the motion, to speak against the motion. Well, I have a little egg on my face because I had the honor of working on new legislative orientation, and I just got done telling them that the very least that we can do for the public and our constituents, and one of the most important things we do, is to come here and sit before them and hear their problems. This could eliminate that. There is no worse look for the legislatures. Yes, this is very good for legislators. You don't have to come. I, I don't come here to do things that are good for me. I come here to do things that are good for the public. And sometimes that's hard, inconvenient, but I volunteered just like the rest of you, and I knew what I was signing up for going in. During the pandemic, I, and we were having virtual committee meetings, I had to introduce one of my bills. I was here working on other things anyway, so I went to the committee room. I was the only human being in the room. So like, picture that. There I am, sitting in a chair in the middle of the committee room, alone, and there are people on screens. It was like something out of a bad science fiction movie. It gets worse. Then they start talking about, well, where's Representative Smith? He's supposed to be introducing his bill. I don't see him logged in. And I'm thinking, really? Like, look at the darn camera. I actually had to start waving my arms. And then they noticed me and laughed because they thought it was funny. What if there were members of the public there to see that? What if they were watching to see that sort of circus debacle? It's embarrassing. We dress professionally when we come here because we're showing the public respect. In committee hearings, we sit politely, dressed well, silently, without our electronics open, 
listening to the public testify. This is a duty that we owe them. If you agree with me, please vote against this rule. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Will the member yield to a question? The member does not yield. Is there a whole is requested a roll call? Is that sufficiently seconded? It is sufficiently seconded. This will be a roll call vote. Members, take your seats. The question before us is the floor amendment to Rule 31. This will be a roll call vote. The chair recognizes Representative Ebel for a parliamentary inquiry. If I know that passing this amendment authorizes the speaker to permit remote or hybrid attendance for House committees and subcommittees as he sees fit, but does not require him to do so. If I know that allowing remote attendance for members would enable those with health, child care, or family challenges to better fulfill their responsibilities to their constituents. If I know we have the experience, knowledge, and ability to operate House committees remotely or in hybrid, and we know well how to do it, and if I know that we never know what the next day will bring, so we really should be prepared, would I now press the green button to pass amend this amendment to House Rule 31? Chair recognizes Representative Stephen Smith for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In the absence of a state of emergency, if I know that this language violates RSA 91A1 Section 3B, which only permits virtual quorums in an emergency. And Mr. Speaker, if I know without this rule, we figured it out last time, then would I press the red button to vote against this unnecessary rule? The question before us is the floor amendment to Rule 31. This is a roll call vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. If all members present had an opportunity to vote, House will attend the state of the vote. 180 voting yay, 195 voting nay, the amendment fails. Mr. Representative Sweeney is offering a floor amendment to Rule 46. Mr. Chair recognizes Representative. Mr. Well, what reason does the member rise? To make a motion, Mr. Speaker. State your motion. Mr. Speaker, I would move to table this uh, rule amendment. That is a proper motion. So the motion before us is to table. And I would request a division vote. 
the table before amendment to Rule 46. And a division has been requested. Members, take your seats. The question before us is the tabling motion to House Rule 46. This is going to be a division vote. The chair recognizes Representative Weber for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know that the current practice when a committee has a divided uh, vote is to offer the ought to pass motion first. And if I know that this rule is fair because it is completely content neutral, and if I know that permitting the chair or ranking the chair or the vice chair of a committee to pick which motion comes first may be quicker, but it certainly negates the work of the other 19 members of the committee. And if I've heard here already that we are here to do the people's work and not to do it for our own convenience, would I now vote yes on the tabling motion to keep the process fair and with a level playing field? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Chair, recognize the representative Sweeney. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Inquiry. If I know that we are here to do the people's work and not for our own convenience, and if I further know that we should debate the House rules by doing the people's work uh, and that this rule deserves to be debated among this body and not simply put away on the table, uh, would I now vote the red button uh, to not table this rule amendment? Thank you. The motion before us is to table the floor amendment to House Rule 46. This is a division vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. Have all members present had an opportunity to vote? Chair will attend to the state of the vote. Uh, House will be in order. The chair did vote to make the tie, thus the motion fails. The question before us it now is the floor amendment to House Rule 66 to 46. The chair recognizes Representative Sweeney. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I'm glad to be debating this rule amendment with all of you today. Uh, it's a very 
simple uh, rule amendment to change the current practice of the House. My amendment reads, if a report comes to the House without recommendation, the House shall first consider the motion of the chair or vice chair, if the chair is absent, of the committee makes on the floor. We are really in unprecedented times with the House of Representatives being so close in number. We recognize that. Everybody in this room can recognize that. We are going to have a large number of bills coming up committee split 10 to 10, regardless of the content of the bills, regardless of what is going on, who is there on the day of committee. These votes are going, and these motions that are being made out of committee without recommendation will be more frequent this term than they ever have been before. Every time that we have to make a motion, have a vote on a motion that is ought to pass automatically out of the committee that we might not have the votes for and then we have to flip to take the time to then make it to an ITL is going to take time out of our time here to do the people's work. We got to remember the people that we are fighting for when we're in this house. It's, it's not all about the procedures and the process and making sure that we keep things the same way. And, and frankly, we've seen a number of offers of amendments today that would change the way we, we've done things. I didn't agree with them. But this is a modest change for the future of the House so that we can navigate these next two years fighting for the mother who can't heat her house, fighting for the father struggling to pay grocery bills. We're going to fight for the people. And that's what this amendment does. We're going to empower the chairs or the vice chairs of the committees, the people that know what the legislation is going through from their committees, adhering and, and giving them the floor to make the first motion on the bill. It does not mean necessarily that what the chair makes a motion on is what the House is going to pass. It just allows a little bit more of a process to move forward without an automatic ought to pass motion on any bill that comes out of the committee without recommendation. Uh, and for that, I would implore you to vote yes. Thank you. Does the member yield to questions? No. Member does not yield. Chair recognizes Representative Weber. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Nothing is going to keep the members of this House from passionately representing their constituents. Nothing. So no rule change is going to change that. So that's the emotional bit right there. But we are in unprecedented times. We are completely, we are, we are virtually equally divided and our committees are equally divided. And there was a great amount of discussion and cooperation at the beginning of the session to achieve that end. But this rule completely turns that bipartisan agreement on its head because it gives all the power to determine how a bill will proceed, not to the committee as a whole, but to one person on the committee. And the other 19 people's work is therefore ignored. The point of having the ought to pass go first is that it is completely content neutral. And remember, some of the bills will come out ought to pass, some of them will come out, you know, some, some would prefer to have them in expedient to legislate. But if we follow our traditions, we make sure that we are preserving the honor of the work of every single member of a committee and not giving one member the say that each member's vote is entitled to. So it may take us a little longer. We don't know. My suggestion has always been, let's give it a try for a couple of days. If it's too slow, we can go on talking about how to deal with this and if there's a good bipartisan solution, and I think there is very good will on both sides to keep talking about it, then we can always amend these votes by a supermajority, these rules by a supermajority. 
So I would urge you to preserve the integrity of the committee process. Let us not put our convenience over the fairness that we have all pledged in these unprecedented times. And please press the red button. Thank you. Senator Poole has requested a roll call. Is that sufficiently seconded? It is sufficiently seconded. This will be a roll call vote. Members, take your seats. The motion before us is the floor amendment to Rule 46. Chair recognizes Representative Sweeney for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know that the chairs of our committees are nonpartisan administrators of the committee work and process in the New Hampshire House. House will be in order. And if I further know we are only empowering that committee process and the chairs to speak with the caucuses of both committees for what motion should first be brought onto the floor through this amendment in the timely fashion of the House, would I now press the green button? Thank you. Chair, recognize Representative Weber for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know that every single one of the nonpartisan administrators of the committees belong to one party, and I want to level the playing field, would I now push the red button to defeat this motion? Thank you. The motion before us is the floor amendment to Rule 46. This is a roll call vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. All members present had an opportunity to vote. House will attend to the state of the vote. 184 voting yay, 191 voting nay. The motion fails. What reasons have member rise? Mr. The House will be in order. Mr. Speaker, having voted on the prevailing side, I would move reconsideration and uh, ask the members to vote no on reconsideration. The motion, the motion before us is a reconsideration on the floor amendment to Rule 46. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor of reconsideration say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. No. I'm in doubt. The House, the House will have a division vote because I am in doubt. Members that were here only.
The motion before us is the reconsideration motion on the floor amendment to House Rule 46. Motion, voting stations are open. All members present had an opportunity to vote. House will attend the state of the vote. 182 voting nay, 193 voting nay. Reconsideration fails, and that's why I asked for it. Oh. Representative Wilhelm proposes an amendment, floor amendment to House Rule 64. The chair recognizes Representative Muse from Portsmouth. The House will be in order. Their member has a right to be heard. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The amendment before us today would restore a House rule that until 2011 had stood for 40 years. If we approve it, carrying or possessing deadly weapons in this chamber, the gallery, and anterooms would once again be prohibited. For the last few sessions, Changes in the party controlling the majority have controlled the fate of deadly weapons in this chamber. Under the current rule, which this amendment would change, deadly weapons can be brought into this chamber, but they must be concealed because displaying them is prohibited. Those who favor the current rule argue that legislators and visitors deserve the right to defend themselves. They claim that changing the rule to ban guns from the chamber would make us soft targets for terrorists and mass shooters. To that, I would respectfully say, welcome to the club. This is a risk that school children in New Hampshire and across the country live with every day. Not to mention people who walk into grocery stores, hospital workers, and every person who ventures outside their home into a public place. With gun ownership now at a record high and more firearms in circulation than ever before, it's become sadly apparent that more guns in more places isn't part of the solution. It's part of the problem. In this particular chamber, the firing of a weapon, either intentionally, uh, in self-defense, or accidentally, comes with tremendous risks. Take a look around this room and take a look at your colleagues. Look at a legislator who might be sitting a few sections over from you and draw a mental line between yourself and that person. Depending on where you sit and who you're looking at, that mental line you just drew could intersect or come within a few inches of a dozen or more of your colleagues. Now imagine that we're not talking about a mental line. Imagine that we're talking about a bullet from a dropped firearm inadvertently discharging, something that's already happened multiple times. Or imagine that it's a bullet intentionally discharged by a person uh, in, a, in a situation where uh, adrenaline is flowing uh, and where nobody really quite understands what's going on 
in response to a perceived threat. Either way, the risks are obvious. In a crowded chamber where legislators are packed into seats like sardines and where the gallery is quite often frequented with children. In the years that deadly weapons have been allowed in this chamber, there have been several incidents where firearms have been accidentally dropped. In a crowded room with cramped seating that often forces many of us to vault over each other, uh, simply to do what I'm doing now, to speak at the well, uh, or just to use the restroom, the risk of accidents and accidental discharges is very real. But beyond concerns for public safety, as well as our own safety and our own individual rights, this issue raises a key question. Is this chamber an appropriate or a necessary place for people to bring guns or other weapons? Or should it be a place reserved for goodwill, healthy debates, and our best ideas for moving this state forward so all of our constituents can lead better lives? We don't allow deadly weapons to be carried into our courtrooms. We don't allow them to be carried into prisons. And whether openly displayed or concealed, we shouldn't allow them to be carried into the people's house by anyone other than troopers and security professionals trained to deal with these situations. Please vote yes to support this amendment. Chair recognizes Representative Roy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Colleagues, we were just asked to do a lot of imagining. Imagine this, you live in a country where you don't have to give a reason, it's your right. The Constitution says it's your right. State law, house rules do not trump the Constitution. We've already found that out last term when someone tried to stop a member from carrying and it went all the way to the Supreme Court. And that side argued that house rules reign supreme. The Supreme Court of the state said, no, they do not. The Constitution reigns supreme. So we don't have to give a reason. We don't have to imagine. It's our right to defend ourselves. And as I heard earlier, no house rule is going to stop the members from defending themselves. Please vote against this. Thank you. The House will be in order. Representative Hull has requested a roll call. Is that sufficiently seconded? It is sufficiently seconded. This will be a roll call vote. Members, take your seats. The motion before us is the floor amendment to Rule 64. This is a roll call vote. Chair recognizes Representative Wilhelm for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know that firearms in Representatives Hall did not used to be a partisan issue, and that for decades there was bipartisan agreement that this chamber was not an appropriate place for deadly weapons. If I know that the State House has well-trained armed security personnel and state troopers who work every day to protect us. And Mr. Speaker, if I know that accidents do happen and that firearms have been mishandled on State House grounds on multiple occasions in recent terms. 
then would I now vote to restore common sense to our rules and press the green button to adopt this amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Chair, recognize Representative Hull for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, members of the House. If I know that when seconds count, right, unfortunately law enforcement are minutes away, if I know that this House has had a consistent problem-free version of this rule, sorry, not of this rule, allowing carry in the House for the last 15 or so years without a problem, would I now oppose the adoption of this amendment? Thank you. The motion before us is the four amendment to House Rule 64. This is a roll call vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. Put that down. All members present had an opportunity to vote. House will attend to the state of the vote. 177 voting nay, 197 voting nay. The motion fails. Representative Poole has a four amendment to 50, rule 52. I have no debate. I chair recognize Representative Hull. Members of the House, the consent calendar comes at the front of the regular calendar every week. And having pulled a number of bills off of consent in the eight years I was here, I can testify to the fact that I probably pulled more than most. And there's lots of reasons to pull a bill. But out of all the bills I pulled off consent, I was successful in flipping it once. House Bill 668 in 2016, it was a 19 to 0 vote out of committee. After about a month, we got the bill flipped from an ITL to an auto pass. The success rate on flipping bills on the floor is very, very low when it's pulled off a of consent. The reason I introduced this amendment is if there's any desire to actually have a discussion, finding 10 other people to agree with you is not a difficult task. If you want to voice your opposition to the clerk on a bill, you can submit a little slip of paper saying, I didn't like House Bill whatever, and it can be noted in the permanent journal. Six minutes in this chamber equates to one man week worth of time. We should be very careful about how we use the house time. I don't want to see someone take and pull a bunch of bills off consent and force everyone to sit in their seats for several hours just to delay the proceedings. I would ask for your support on this. Thank you. Chair recognize Representative Verville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, colleagues. Um, starting my fourth term in the New Hampshire House of Representatives, and I'm, I'm honored to be here, as, as you all are, we are often cautioned against uh, looking for solutions to problems that don't exist. So uh, do bills get pulled off of consent? Yes, they do. Uh, I'm sorry to hear about the representatives' um, you know, inability to get those committee recommendations flipped when he pulled them off consent. Um, but 
in three terms, three full terms, I've never seen uh, abuse of pulling bills off of consent. I pulled one off last session. I, I knew that bill was going nowhere, but I owed it to my constituents to fight the good fight, and uh, those, those debates are usually very limited in, in time. And so um, there's only one story I've ever heard of of a, a representative from, from Manchester who may or may not have pulled every bill off consent and then promptly went home. Um, but that's kind of elegant too, right? I mean, that's, you gotta tip your hat to that. This is, this is a solution chasing a problem that doesn't exist. And for that reason, I would encourage you to vote uh, against this rule amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The motion before us is the floor amendment to House Rule 52. Are you ready for the question? Division has been requested. Representative Dan McGuire requests a division. Members will take your seats. This will be a division vote. The motion before us is a floor amendment to Rule 52. The House will be in order. This will be a division vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. If all members present had an opportunity to vote, House will attend to state of the vote. 206 voting yay, 167 voting nay. The amendment is, is adopted. <laughs> Representative Dutsey has a floor amendment to Rule 58. Chair recognizes Representative Dutsey. Mr. Speaker and colleagues, my floor amendment is very simple and only changes one word. Can, can you hear? Oh, you, you can't hear me? Okay. How, how's that? Okay? Okay. Oh. <laughs> okay. Mr. Speaker and colleagues. My floor amendment is very simple and only changes one word. Under order of business, I am requesting that Rule 58, subparagraph A, number one, be changed from prayer to invocation. It would then read, invocation by the chaplain or a substitute designated by the speaker. Webster's New World College Dictionary, the fourth edition, defines invocation as, quote, 
the act of calling on God, capital G, a God, small g, a saint, the muses, for a blessing, whereas a prayer is defined as, quote, the act or pra practice of praying to God, capital G. As the word prayer speaks more to religion, invocation has a broader meaning which can be spiritual in nature, but not necessarily religious. An invocation can be a prayer, but it does not need to be a prayer. Although many in this chamber seek guidance from a higher being, others seek guidance and centering from more earthly imagery, the, ma the majesty of walking through a forest, for example, or pursuits such as the camaraderie of working on a shared task. The word invocation allows for the inclusion of these and similar images in the opening of our sessions, and I ask for your consideration in making this change. Thank you. Motion the motion before us is the floor amendment to House Rule 58. Are you ready for the question? Representative Verville requests a roll call. Is that sufficiently seconded? It is sufficiently seconded. Members will take your seats. motion before us is the floor amendment to House Rule 58. Chair, this is a roll call vote. Chair, recognize the Representative Simpson for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I know that the term invocation is frequently used to describe the religious or spiritual act at the beginning of an event or a ceremony, and if I know that the term invocation takes into account the multiplicity of religious and spiritual practices of house members, of visitors, and of Granite Staters. And finally, if I know that using the term invocation doesn't inhibit the work of the chaplain, would I now press the green button to make this small but meaningful change to the rules? Thank you. Chair, I recognize Representative Vervo for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if, if I know we've heard a lot of uh, reasons why we should honor tradition and not be uh, making changes for the sake of making changes, uh, Mr. Speaker, if I also know that it is actually not unheard of to have invocations and not technically prayers given at the opening uh, of If I know, oh, hey, if I know, Mr. Speaker, that invocations have been given and not technically prayers at the beginning of, of session and that there is, of course, no, no ban on giving an invocation over giving uh, a prayer, uh, then, Mr. Speaker, would I, now not pre would I now press the red button so that we do not change this one word in this one rule and we stick with our traditions? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The motion before us is the floor amendment to Rule 58. This is a roll call vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds.
If all members present had an opportunity to vote, I also will attend the state of the vote. 183 voting yay, 190 voting nay. The motion fails. Representative Prout moves floor amendment to Rule 58. Wait a minute, Representative. Nope. Chair recognizes Representative Prout. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this new rule is about speeches under unanimous consent of the House, usually at the end of our day after the third reading motion. These speeches aren't on the topic of the business, aren't on a topic of business before the House. They're about anything else a member would like to pu publicly mention. Memorial remarks, remarks about an important event in history, or even one member has used the time to wish his wife a happy anniversary as he was stuck in session on that special day. The current process is that if unanimous consent is withdrawn, it triggers a vote on if the member should be allowed to continue with the consent of the House. This currently requires a simple majority of those present. This rule change would require a 60% majority of those present for the member to continue speaking. We have had several instances of issues with this in the past where it came down to a party line vote. I don't think this serve, serves anyone well, nor the House as an institution, to have a party line vote on this topic. With our razor thin division between the parties this term, every vote under the existing rule will be a toss up, especially at the end of the day. This is an area where I think it makes sense to require a supermajority and that off-topic speeches like this should only be made with bipartisan agreement of the members. And this rule would implement that by setting the bar at three-fifths. I ask you to vote yes to pass this rule change. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The motion before us is the floor amendment to House Rule 58. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and the motion is adopted. Representative Weber has a floor amendment to House Rule 58. Chair recognizes Representative Weber. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I agree entirely with the previous speaker, and what we just passed is one half of the amendment that I suggested um, after discussion with colleagues on both sides of the aisle. One of the things that has happened, once, once an objection to consent has happened, According to Mason's rules, it may not be renewed. So you get to object once, and that's it. At least once in this chamber, that has been used by somebody who, before a member even began to speak, got up and said, I object. And we all sat here and wondered why they were objecting. Well, we all voted to let the member speak. And then the member strayed into some more politically charged waters. And somebody stood up and said, I object. And the clerk said, you can't renew the objection because Masons doesn't allow it. And it's not in our house rules. So the, what the second part of my amendment does is it allows the objection to be renewed once. We don't want to do this forever. Nobody wants to be here all night. But the objection can be renewed once if somebody strays into murky waters. So I urge the adoption of this amendment, which incorporates the earlier amendment. Thank you. The motion before us is the division, floor amendment to House Rule 58. A division has been requested. Members will take their seats.
The motion before us is a floor amendment to rule, House Rule 58. This is a division vote. Chair recognizes Representative Weber for a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if we've already done good work, but if there's a little more work to be done, and I want to be able to renew an objection one time to keep us on track, would I then press the green button? Thank you. Chair, I recognize Representative Proud for parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if I know there have been discussions about this second part that the previous representative mentioned and that we have not yet come to a full agreement on how it should be handled. And if I also know that the amendment before us does not mesh well with the previous amendment that we passed and the language and the rules will then get very convoluted as to what part should control if we were to pass both, would I now press the red button and not pass this amendment? The motion before us is the amendment to House Rule 58. This is a division vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. All members present had an opportunity to vote. House will attend the state of the vote. 200 voting yay, 193 voting nay. The motion passes. Chair recognizes the clerk for a motion. Mr. Speaker, Representative Ladd moves that the House vacate the reference of House Bill 207 relative to school district unanticipated funds to the Committee on Education. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed nay. The ayes have it. And 207 is referred to Committee on Finance. For what reason does the member rise? Uh, to make a motion, Mr. Speaker. State your motion. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to move that the um, debate on the previous rule change that we just passed by a vote of 200 to 173 be placed into the permanent journal uh, to make it clear that the renewal of an objection is, is once and, and only once and that it can't be recurring. The motion is to print the remarks without objection. Representative Reed has a floor amendment to House Rule 100. Chair recognizes Representative Reed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the um, rules change before us here would simply say that if a chair and committee institutes a time limit, that that time limit be applied equally. Um, I think this is something we all understand to be basic fairness, and indeed most good chairs already um, observe that practice. There are certainly some conditions in which a chair might have to change time limit or institute a time limit. For example, uh, if a hearing is going long and a time limit was not instituted but then has to be instituted, or if, for example, there's an expert that's relaying information that only that expert is privy to, um, that is why in this rule change 
um, it, the statement is included. If this process cannot be followed, the chairman must submit a statement explaining why this could not be done for the committee file. So it's not onerous. Um, if there are legitimate reasons that the chair cannot follow this, all they have to do is submit the statement for the clerk and for the committee file. Um, but this would help discourage something that has happened in the past, which is the abuse of this um, predominant precedent. Um, and Mr. Speaker, I request a division. Member yield to questions? Yes, Mr. Speaker. Member yields. Senator Harrington, you may inquire. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for taking my question. I'm just trying to get this straight. So if, if there's a time limit set for the amount of speakers, because there's too many, looks like there's going to be a lot of speakers, then the chair would not have the uh, discretion to say, I'll give you an example from my committee, the science and tech, uh, that the commissioner of the Department of Energy is speaking, and he gets to have more time than a private individual from Massachusetts who just happens to drive up and want to talk on a subject, that that wouldn't be allowed? That is incorrect. As I just explained, as I just explained, the purpose of this rule is to prevent the abuse of what has been practiced in the past, to prevent basically paltry political uh, game playing with time limits. And that is why if a chair does choose to change time limit halfway through or allow a particular expert, all they have to do is submit a note into the committee file saying why that they could not or chose not to do that. Follow up. Does the member yield or further question? Oh, yes, I do. Well, so so it seems to me as if it doesn't really accomplish anything because if the, if the chairman's doing this, if the chairman is doing this because of what you say this, is political reasons. This is a question, he Representative. Could just, he could just justify that by writing down whatever he wanted. Then. The point is to discourage what I would just simply bluntly call cheating. And so if you have to come up with an actual reason that you cannot allow equal time to everybody, but your actual reason was paltry politics, then you'd have to come up with something creative. If you know that you have to disclose that in advance, then maybe you don't do that. I request a division. Does the member yield a further question? Last one. Last one. Thank you, Representative. Occasionally, we've all seen in committee uh, someone comes in to testify and they get very emotional. They break down into tears. I've seen it, I'm sure you've seen it. And when that occurs, I would like to think that the chair would have the discretion to give that individual some extra time without being constrained by this type of uh, limitation. Could you, could you respond to that, please? Absolutely, once again, that would be a simple note by the chair placed into the committee file. The person providing testimony was experiencing emotional distress and had to be given extra time to compose themselves. Chair recognize the representative Hunt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as a past chairman for many years, um, there have been situations where you kind of recalibrate what's going on in the committee. I myself personally would always uh, make any changes in discussing it with the minority or the opposite party. And I don't think that the idea of putting this in rules is really going to make people do things better or do something more honest or do something right. Writing a note is, seems a little extraneous to be sticking in a file. Uh, and let alone, would, it, would people second guess what the chairman was doing? At the end of the day, we got our YouTube, everybody can see what happened in the committee, and then everyone can be the judge of what the chair did. Motion before us is the floor amendment to House Rule 100. Are you ready for the question? A division has been requested. Members will take their seats.
The motion before us is the floor amendment to House Rule 100. This is a division vote. If you're, in, <clears throat> if you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. For all members present an opportunity to vote, House will attend the state of the vote. 114 voting yay, 256 voting nay, the motion fails. President Reed offers a floor amendment to House Rule 106. Chair recognizes Representative Reed. The House will be in order. The member has a right to be heard. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, um, House Rule 106 simply codifies what is already supposed to be our practice, which is to say a member, any member, can participate in a hearing from either one side or the other of the table. Either they testify or they question. They do not do both, and that that rule will apply equally to everybody. It is predominantly the practice, but has not always been equally applied. And I think that the people of this state deserve to have uniformity in how their bills are treated here, regardless of the committee chair that happens to be sitting on that committee that day. So it's fairly simple, and that's about it. The motion before us is the floor amendment to House Rule 106. Are you ready for the question? A division has been requested. Members will take their seats. The motion before us is the floor amendment to House Rule 106. This is a division vote. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. If all members present had an opportunity to vote, I also will attend the state of the vote. 200 voting yay, 169 voting nay. The motion 
Pastors. Chair recognizes a member from Auburn, Representative Osborne, for a motion to adjourn from the early session. Make it resolved that the House now adjourn from the early session, that the business of the late session be in order at the present time, and when the House adjourns today, it be to meet on Thursday, January 5th, 2023. Ask the members to stay in your seats until we're done. We're almost there. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed nay. The ayes have it, and the motion is adopted. The House will attend to announcements. The Chair recognizes Representative Carol McGuire for a uh, announcement. The House will be in order. We're almost done. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members of EDNA were having orientation on Monday. And if you want a copy of the performance audit that we will be discussing, it is available in room 306. Chair recognizes a clerk for announcement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have a few announcements to share. One, uh, from organization day to today, you may have noticed if you've been in the back that the mailboxes have been fixed. Uh, so please note that they may not be in the same place that they were on organization day. As you know, the Department of Motor Vehicles is here for license plates and legislative IDs across the street in the legislative office building in room 103. In room 104, for freshman members, uh, there are your um, key cards to be able to enter the uh, building, also your security lapel pins. Uh, so you can swing by and get those there. They will be here tomorrow as well, if you are not going to be here tomorrow. Beginning at 1 o'clock today, there will be an anti-harassment, uh, excuse me, um, not 1 o'clock, 30 minutes after we break, I'm looking for the Chief of Staff, 30 minutes after we break today, uh, there will be an anti-harassment and discrimination training happening here in Reps Hall. Uh, it will be put on by the Attorney General's office uh, and all members are encouraged to attend. Uh, this week begins the opt-in process for the mailing of house calendars. If you have not opted in to receive your calendar via mail, uh, please come down after session and we will take your name and, and uh, we will uh, add you to the mailing list. And I want to just take a moment to address the USPS issue. We are aware that there is a USPS issue. Uh, I have sent calendars that have come back to me two weeks later that were uh, addressed properly. Uh, we, I have been in touch with the federal uh, congressional delegation about this issue. We are working on it. We hope to resolve it, but please be mindful that we, we are sending them out on time, and I apologize that they are not getting to you on time. Please, be, please remember that they are published online in, on the afternoon of Thursday, and uh, they if you need to print them out, or we do have copies here. So if you want to opt out of mailing, that's fine. We will have copies here. Uh, another announcement, sorry, financial disclosures. Only 153 of you have completed thus far. You are required by statute RSA 14 that you must file your uh, financial statement once per biennium. You can do this through the portal um, online. If you are having issues with that, you can see Rich Lambert down in the Office of Legislative Services. Lastly, Representative Fitzpatrick, you left your name tag over in the LOB. I have that upstairs for you. I'd just quickly like to thank all those who attended the uh, training uh, two weeks ago on civility. Um, I missed some of it, but I saw some of it. I think it's something that everybody can uh, take notice of and, and try and apply over the next two years. Representative Horgan requests unanimous consent. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And also, uh, congratulations on your reelection, which we did in one ballot. Um, so even if nothing had happened at the Capitol or anywhere else that day, Wednesday, January 6, 2021, would have been an unforgettable day for me and everyone else who was serving in the House last session. That was the day we held our convening day session, the one we just completed successfully now, at UNHS a lot. And it was especially memorable for me because it happened in my own neighborhood, just a few blocks from my house. The, the, well, the members has been for a minute. 
Yeah. We're almost, almost completely done. We still need a quorum for the final motion. So please, everybody just stay put for a few more minutes. Thank you. Member may continue. It's, um, my remarks are pretty short anyway. The parking lot session was a, uh, it was a wacky idea, but we, we pulled it off. We completed our work successfully and peacefully. Things were less peaceful at the Capitol, although the Congress eventually finished its work in the wee hours of Thursday, January 7th. Um, no thanks to now former President Trump. On um, January 6th, I still... Um, I... The, me the member shouldn't be referring to any former president in any s disrespect. Oh. Okay. Let's... Um... Okay, anyway, that day I was using an old phone with weak battery and um, much weaker than my current phone. Also, there's no Wi-Fi in a lot. So I was unable to see the video from Washington, D.C.'s, but I could see the headlines. And of course, I was busy with our work in the parking lot. So I didn't grasp the full magnitude of what happened until I got panicky phone calls from family members. Now, it's a blessing not seeing that video in real time. It spared me personally some of the shock. And I am horrified and still horrified, and I don't think it matters who the was member will or was suspend. not at fault for it. I, it was the, horrifying. The, the member will suspend. All right, thank you. Representative Summers has withdrawn his consent. Oh, good. We have the first test case of the new procedure. Thank you. I guess, I guess like any other... The member, the member will suspend. We have to vote. Okay, then. Members need to take their seats. This is gonna Members need to take your seats. This is going to be a division vote. We need the count. Members will be in their seats. This will be a division vote, and it takes 60% for the three-fifths for the members to continue. If you're in favor, you'll press the green button. If you're opposed, you'll press the red button. Voting stations are open for 30 seconds. All members present had an opportunity to vote. House will attend the state of the vote. Seven, <laughs> House will be in order. 77 voting yay, 272 voting nay. The member may not continue.
For what reason does the member rise? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, forgive me, I don't know the name of the actual motion. I believe it's a parliamentary inquiry. I'm curious to know what is the specific rule and in which of our documents are we not allowed to say something that would be considered disparaging of a U.S., a former U.S. president? I'm just... Disparaging remarks are are about anybody and ever allowed in this chamber. That that goes for that's that's been a, pretty much a standing tradition for a long time. Okay. May I clarify, Mr. Speaker? I, I don't think I actually meant disparaging as much as criticism of a former uh, constructive criticism of a former U.S. president. Well, uh, that that's that's disparaging remarks. Okay, just clarifying. Thank, I, I would like to know what the um, specific rule it, or part of our documents that we follow that says that, just so we can fully understand. Genuinely just curious, nothing nefarious in asking this. We'll, we'll, we'll address that in, in our next notice. Representative Ars Yes, what, for what reason does a member rise? Is it not true that it has been the practice and precedent of this House for long since before I was here that we do not disparage other people nor do we impart motive to other people because that's simply not helpful in our debates? You are right, Representative. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. House, House will be in order. Representative Osborne moves that the House stand in recess for the purpose of introduction of bills, vacate motions, and receiving messages. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and the motion is adopted. The, 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 House, the House is in recess to the call of the chair. Oh, I, I, wait a minute, wait, I'm sorry. Until 11.15 tomorrow where the governor will be sworn in.